Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 145 of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick. This episode is part one of a, hopefully, three-part series on recipes that'll be spread across the next few weeks or months as we have the opportunity to develop and record the episodes. So if you're wondering where the other two installments are, they're coming. They just might not drop immediately one after another. But I feel like I'm bearing the lead here. Recipes. Why recipes? Well, they're kind of the one thing that all cocktails have in common. If a drink has a name, then you can also assume it has an origin story that situates it in time and place, a set of ingredients, a combination or transformation sequence, and service instructions. These simple components are the mechanical framework that allows us to manipulate the flavorful warp and weft of cocktails, weaving experiences that play out on the palate and in the imagination. If you're one of the folks who's been cooped up at home during this quarantine situation we're facing in 2020, it's entirely possible you've had the chance recently to work with a new recipe, or maybe the time and space to recreate one of your all-time favorites. And if you think about it, a recipe is basically an assembly manual for food or drink. It lays out all the parts and tells you how to put them together so that you come out with the right end product. But there's so much more to a recipe. There's not only what's written, but how it's written, who it's written for, and even what's left to the imagination. In this episode, we'll take a look back deep into history at the evolution of the recipe across the ancient world, including ancient Babylon and Rome. The goal is to find the earliest possible precursors to our modern recipes for food and drink so that we can learn everything they have to teach us. But first... Let's take a hard left turn and, like we always do, give you the chance to make yourself a drink. This episode's featured cocktail is the zombie, which might sound like a bizarre choice for an episode that doesn't have anything to do with tiki drinks. Or does it? We'll actually return to the zombie for a very specific reason later in the show, but for now, let's just focus on how to make it. You'll need three quarters of an ounce of fresh lime juice, one half ounce of falernum, which is a spiced syrup, one and a half ounce of gold Puerto Rican rum, one and a half ounce of gold or dark Jamaican rum, one ounce of overproof Demerara rum, one bar spoon grenadine, six drops per node, which is an absinthe substitute, one dash of Angostura bitters, and one half ounce Don's mix. Put all these ingredients into an electric blender with six ounces or three quarters of a cup of crushed ice, then blend at high speed for no more than five seconds. Pour it into your tiki mug or other tall glass of choice, add ice to fill, and garnish with a nice sprig of mint. This recipe, by the way, was taken from Jeff Beachbum Berry's blog. He's the resource on all things tiki. Now, All the ingredients I just listed are things, even the falernum, that exist at any good liquor store near you. All, I should say, except one. We'll return to that one fateful ingredient later on in this episode because it has a very important lesson to teach us about how recipes are created and shared. I'm really excited about this little mini-series we're putting together because it's nerdy and esoteric. But you also have to keep in mind that recipes are one of those little invisible threads that run through each and every one of our lives, and I'm personally stoked to give this subject matter some serious time and attention to see what we might discover. So with that, I'm pleased to cut right to the chase here and present to you this first installment of our Art of the Recipe series. Enjoy. Part 1. Origins. If we really want to get to the heart of what a recipe is and what it does, then we need to trace our way back to the very origins of food and drink 
preparation, back in time so far that we find ourselves face to face with an ape-like creature who has descended from the trees somewhere in Africa. But although it was a major risk for these first proto-humans to abandon their arboreal sanctuary in favor of a dangerous life on the ground, it was a risk with a very specific reward attached to it. Here's boozy historian Mark Forsyth, who explains what is commonly known as the drunken monkey hypothesis. Check it out. It's pretty convincing. I should point out before we get going that all of the higher apes and most intelligent mammals and even some very stupid mammals like a drink. They will drink alcohol whenever they can get hold of it. It's just they can't make it. But alcohol does occur naturally. If you just leave fruit to rot, it starts producing alcohol. And it's, uh, alcohol is a very good source of energy. And uh, human beings are uniquely good at processing it. We are the second best animal in the entire world for um, taking our booze after the Malaysian tree shrew. So never ever get into a drinking contest with the Malaysian tree shrew. But after that, we <laughs> have a quite specific mutation in our genes. Uh, which uh, goes back about 10 million years, which allows us to process alcohol way better than most animals and to get more energy out of it. About 10% of all the enzymes in your liver are there just to get energy out of alcohol. And this led people to say, why do we have that? Interestingly, 10 million years ago is just about the time we came down from the trees. And so the theory runs something along the lines of we came down from the trees to get this ripe, rotting fruit, which has fallen onto the forest floor. That's why we come down from the trees, which has this alcohol in it, which is great for our energy. We actually develop a nose. We, we, we're like great white, you know, great white sharks can smell blood, you know, miles and miles away. We are like that with alcohol. Humans have this incredible ability to smell alcohol, which other animals don't have. So we wandered around looking for our rotting fruit. When we found it, we ate a bit, but it was it was a big find to find a, a, the you know, proper alcoholic rotting fruit. And so we then needed another little mutation in our genes, which we have, which dates from the same time, which is to make us eat a lot. And I don't know if you've had that thing of going on a night out, having quite a bit to drink and then desperately needing a burger or in Britain, it's usually a kebab or a pizza or some, some food. That's because right. drink, drinking alcohol actually uh, triggers it's the famine response in your brain. It makes you hungry. It's the same as if you're actually being starved. You go, I mean, when you say I'm starving when you're drunk, you actually sort of are. And so you therefore eat loads and loads. This, um, you can now store it as fat. You can survive for days on this. This is great. But, and this is the final part of the drunken monkey hypothesis, you get drunk. And this is a little bit dangerous. If you're just lying around on the forest floor on your own, drunk, and along comes a saber-toothed tiger or Tyrannosaurus rex, which would be achronological, but there we are, then you need to be able to protect yourself from that predator. And that, the final part of the drunken monkey hypothesis, is that that's why humans drink socially. We drink together, and we've always, according to the drunken monkey hypothesis, drunk together so that we can fight off predators, so that we can protect each other when we are helplessly drunk. Now, you may be wondering at this point what rotting fruit and genetic mutations have to do with recipes. Well, it just so happens that two other major advances took place shortly after we were seduced from the trees by the siren song of rotten fruits. Those advances being fire and language. Probably, in fact, in that order. A lot of evolutionary research indicates a correlation between the advent of cooking and a major increase in brain size in pre-human hominids, which scientists can measure by comparing the size of the brain vault in fossilized skulls of our early ancestors dating back over a million years. This is because the brain is an expensive organ when it comes to energy consumption. While it comprises only 2% of an average human's body mass, it takes up about 20% of all caloric energy in the body. When you consider this in light of the fact that cooking food makes calories and certain nutrients more available to the human body, it's easy to draw a correlation between fire, food preparation, and brain growth, which in turn paves the way for language. I bring this up because I think it's absolutely fascinating that language, food, and drink are so interrelated. In fact, I imagine that many of the first proto-conversations centered around the correct way to harvest and prepare food. 
back then it was a matter of life and death, and language was a great tool to keep our ancestors on the right side of that dichotomy. Now, here's Mark Forsyth again, talking about the role of food and drink on the way isolated groups of hunter-gatherers put down roots and formed complex societies. Another argument, which is very convincing, is that society actually, or uh, farming, started, uh, hunter-gathering stopped and farming started to obtain alcohol. We settled down to farm so that we could make our own beer. And this is actually, this is another one which sounds crazy until you stop and think about it, which is that if you are hunting and gathering, eating other animals, then you get a lot of vitamin B out of other animals, which you need to not die. Whereas if you just stop and you start farming and making bread, bread has no vitamin B in it. So if you tried to do that, you just start with the bread, you would you would definitely die. Fortunately, though, beer, which is also made out of uh, grain, wheat, barley, etc., beer contains vitamin B. So if we settled down to farms and uh, agricultural economy, we must have started with beer, or at least beer and bread right next to each other. And beer makes sense to start with, because if you actually if you have a pile of barley and you want to get the most energy out of it, the best thing you can do is turn it into beer in terms of the calorie count rather than into bread. So, yeah, civilization farming started with with beer. That That's a very widely accepted thought and then and then things uh, i mean it's connected to everything we do because we've always been drinkers when writing started writing started just as a usually as a form of ious an accounting system that you noted down you've given me five bushels of grain draw a bushel of grain and return iou seven women draw seven women one of the earliest letters therefore in these uh, pictogram alphabets was the symbol for beer so that's right there from the beginning and then the these primitive societies form with again with uh, their gods and goddesses and always there's a goddess of beer and a goddess of drunkenness and a, usually, usually female in the early days ninkazi and hathor in ancient egypt who was the crazy beer goddess who went between being the goddess of love, the goddess of destruction, but always the drunk goddess. This places us in history at around the time of the oldest recipes ever unearthed by archaeologists, which can be traced back almost 4,000 years to ancient Mesopotamia. These little cuneiform tablets are somewhat contemporaneous with the Babylonian king Hammurabi, famous for his complex legal system, and they present ingredients and very basic instructions for preparing a number of different dishes, including venison stew with cilantro, which I'll link to on the show notes page. Originally, the written language and the clay tablets it was inscribed upon pertained to commerce. Right, the exchange of goods and services, and the value communicated in that exchange. Because of this, precise weights and measures were important, but it's interesting that they're largely absent from these OG recipes. Now, one through line we'll see with recipes during this Origins episode is that they weren't so concerned with units of measurement until much later in history. And there could be a number of reasons for this. Early on, it was probably because there was very little value in recreating a very specific dish in a precise manner because you couldn't just drive to the supermarket and pick up whatever your heart desired. You were subject to the seasons, the weather, random droughts, famines, and a whole bunch of other stuff beyond human control. So if you could throw something together with whatever you had on hand and it filled you up or got you drunk and tasted good at the same time, then it was a success. Weights and measures be damned. But today we really value the ability to faithfully recreate dishes and cocktails as close as possible to the way they were originally made. This process connects us with our heritage. It prevents us from, of course, making silly mistakes and ruining the dish or the drink, and it allows us not to have to carry all of our recipes around in our noggins, freeing up our memory for other things. But this dedication to accuracy and precision in recipes is a much newer concern than you might expect. Here's recent podcast guest Aaron Knoll, who brings to light some burning questions about certain cocktail ingredients that were in widespread use less than 150 years ago, but that we may still never be able to recreate today. So this is really fascinating because I have been really preoccupied with some of the Weird cocktails in Jerry Thomas's bartender's manual. Like he has like this gin and pine thing in there, which is like, yeah, he barely describes it. And 
I found very little about it outside of maybe one reference in, you know, a Boston newspaper. So I want to meet Jerry Thomas. I want him to make me a gin and pine, maybe a gin and tansy too. And I want and I, and I want to see what he actually does. I want to know how he makes that. What sort of pine is in that gin on the, uh, you know, it's it's just like it's a mystery to me that and, and I think it would just be really fun to. I mean, and he also sounds like a really fun guy to uh talk to and just get to know like what was it really like mixing gins mixing in the 19th century and can you tell me what an old tom gin is in your opinion as you can see it takes a lot of work and a certain amount of concern for people who will come after you to develop a recipe that will be as useful a hundred years in the future as it is on the day when you first set it down what if their systems of measurement are different what if an ingredient is no longer available what if a terrible tragedy takes place and your language goes extinct? If you were a person in the ancient world, these just wouldn't be things that kept you up at night in the same way that bandits or plagues of locusts or pleasing the goddess of the harvest would. No, unfortunately, the inclusion of precise weights and measures in recipes would come much later in history, so we can't talk about that just yet. But we can talk about a really crucial stepping stone that would eventually allow us to get there. And that stepping stone is the atomistic worldview. Let's move forward in history a bit to the time of the Roman Republic, around the 2nd and 3rd centuries BCE. Now, when we think of this time period, a lot of what comes to mind is a society that basically renamed the Greek gods and claimed them for their own. We think of Rome's military and bureaucratic prowess. We think of elephants crossing Alps. But one thing we don't tend to think of is the humble Adam. To be fair, Romans borrowed the idea that the world is comprised of atoms, just like they borrowed their gods from the Greeks. Philosophers like Democritus and Parmenides paved the way for the notion that the universe is composed of particles that are so small as to be invisible to the naked eye. In fact, Democritus went so far as to explain that the size and shape of atoms had a direct impact on taste perception, claiming that bitterness is caused by small, angular, jagged atoms passing across the tongue, whereas sweetness is caused by larger, smoother, more rounded atoms passing across the tongue. But it was the Greek philosopher Epicurus who advanced the theory and really honed it to create an atomistic worldview that explained all objects and phenomena in terms of either atoms or void. Unfortunately, no primary sources of Epicurus's writing exist, but historians widely regard the Roman poet Lucretius and his epic poem Durerum Natura, The Nature of Things, to be an accurate mouthpiece for Epicurean philosophy. If that epic poem, Durerum Natura, sounds familiar, you may be recalling it from our Cocktails in a Time of Plague episode where I referenced its detailed account of the plague of Athens. But aside from that bizarre final chapter, the rest of the poem is much more concerned with unpacking the atomistic nature of the universe. The basic premises of Epicurean atomic physics are as follows. The universe is comprised entirely of atoms and void. Atoms are unlimited in quantity, but have a limited number of types, like letters in an alphabet. Different arrangements of atoms create different materials and experiences, like the same letters can be used to make different words. And finally, all that exists was set in motion by an event called the swerve, which is when one atom changed course and bumped into other atoms, causing a chain reaction of movement and recombination. Today's scholars obviously draw very close parallels between the swerve and the Big Bang Theory, but many earlier Christian scholars viewed this as a validation of the idea of free will. Let's check out Lucretius's explanation of Epicurean flavor theory, which sounds a lot like what we just heard from Democritus. He writes, quote, And it is so straightforward to explain the sense of taste on the tongue and palate, that any extra effort is a waste. First of all, in our mouth we taste the flavors when we chew, squeezing out the savor from our victuals as we do. Just as you might squeeze in your fist a sponge that's sopping wet until it's almost dry. The flavors we press out then get dispersed through pores all over the palate, distributing among the tortuous passageways of the more loosely textured tongue. 
Then, if the particles of flavor that ooze out are smooth, they sweetly brush against the tongue and sweetly touch and soothe all watery and moist places about the tongue. The more they tend to be prickly, on the other hand, the more the bodies rend and sting the senses as they are released. End quote. If you know anything about flavor, this is a pretty accurate account of taste receptors, especially considering it was written during ancient times. And what I love most is how down-to-earth Lucretius is with his descriptions of physics. Listen to how he accounts for the different traveling speeds of certain, quote, atoms using lightning and thunder as a case study. Here he is again. Why is it that we hear the thunder after the flash appears to our eyes? Because the particles that travel to our ears always take longer reaching us than those that reach the eyes and trigger sight. Here's an example you can recognize. If you see someone far off with a double-headed axe felling a massive tree, you see the strokes before the thwacks reach your ears. End quote. The reason I bring all this up is because the Roman Republic and later the empire, this society that Lucretius lived and wrote in, paved the way for a lot of progress to be made in food and cooking. Their trade networks made it easy for people to access spices, wines, and ingredients from far off places. They tended not to completely strangle cultures in the places that they conquered, allowing for the circulation of many different ideas and documents. And of course, out of a society that worshipped gods and idols, we have the emergence of of an atomistic worldview eerily similar to our own. Now, to this day, lots of chefs will explain that cooking, or creating a recipe for that matter, is simply applied chemistry and physics. So it comes as no surprise that in a culture rich in ingredients and wealth, and with thinkers who understood that manipulating the building blocks of matter would produce different results, emerged a set of recipes greater and more influential than any that had come before. Enter Apicius, or rather, the Apici. This is a surname that refers to a number of noteworthy Roman gourmands who lived sometime around the first century BCE and were renowned for their culinary taste. Thus, the name became an eponym for anybody who was the Roman equivalent of a foodie, kind of like Don Juan is synonymous with being a womanizer. So, when a collection of hundreds of recipes began circulating among the wealthy kitchen owners of Rome, Apicius became a pretty good pseudonym for the book. This is truly a snapshot of Roman culture worth looking into, especially because it's available for free via Project Gutenberg, which I'll link to over on the show notes page. In total, the collection contains 10 chapters arranged by category that list recipes for everything from rose wine to ostrich to stuffed dormouse. Here's a recipe for Roman vermouth. Quote, Roman vermouth, or absinthe, is made thus, according to the recipe of Camerinum. You need wormwood from Santo for Roman vermouth, or as a substitute, wormwood from the Pontus cleaned and crushed. One Theban ounce of it. Six scruples of mastic, three each of nard leaves, cosmary, and saffron, and 18 quarts of any kind of mild wine. Filter cold. Charcoal is not required because of the bitterness. End quote. Here we begin to see something that resembles today's recipes, something we might have a snowball's chance at recreating if only we could figure out how much a Theban ounce weighs. But unfortunately, the specificity of this recipe is one of very few exceptions in the book not the rule. Check out this recipe for milk-fed snails, and you'll see what I mean. Quote, take snails and sponge them. Pull them out of the shells by the membrane and place them for a day in a vessel with milk and salt. Renew the milk daily. Hourly, clean the snails of all refuse, and when they are so fat that they can no longer retire to their shells, fry them in oil and serve them with wine sauce. In a similar way, they may be fed on a milk porridge. End quote. Let's just assume that milk-soaked snails is a normal thing to eat. Aside from the foreignness of this recipe, you'll notice that there aren't any weights and measures to speak of. How much milk? How much salt? How many snails makes a decent portion? And what do you serve them with besides this generic wine sauce? 
Just like Epicurean physics was more concerned with the real-world implications of atoms than today's theoretical physicists are, you can see a distinct difference between the recipes in Apicius and those that Julia Child wrote, for example. The good thing about Apicius is most definitely its incredible breadth and depth. By studying it closely, you can learn a lot about food and eating in Roman society. But the unfortunate part is that a lot of details fell by the wayside, perhaps intentionally. In the edition of Apicius available on Project Gutenberg, the introduction is written by a fellow named Dr. Frederick Starr, who offers a lot of historical context about the work. Regarding the dearth of certain specific recipe information, he observes, quote, There may have been two chief reasons for concealing necessary information. Apicius, or more likely the professional collectors of the recipes in the work, may have considered technical elaboration of the formula quite superfluous on the assumption that the formulas were for professional use only. Every good practitioner knows, with ingredients or components given, what manipulations are required and what effects are desired. Even in the absence of detailed specifications, the experienced practitioner will be able to define correct proportions by intuition. As a matter of fact, in cookery, the mention in the right place of a single ingredient, like in poetry, the right word, often suffices to conjure up before the gourmet's mental eye vistas of delight. Call it inspiration, association of ideas, or whatever you please, a single word may often prove a guide or a savior. End quote. This kind of makes sense, right? If you're a carpenter, then architectural plans are easier to read than if you're not. If you have a lot of experience sailing, you can learn to read the wind and the waves better than a landlubber. So it makes sense to me that chefs can look at an ingredient in context and infer how it should be prepared. Now, there are two other potential reasons Star cites for the lack of detail in these recipes. One is simple. During Roman times, Paper or parchment was expensive and hard to come by, so one might be motivated to keep things concise from a cost perspective. The other reason is a bit more insidious. It's possible, says Starr, that among wealthy Romans there was competition to throw the best parties and to have the best dishes served. And so the omission of key instructions or secret ingredients may have been a way of maintaining status by guarding the recipes that made other folks jealous. But if you think that hoarding recipe information was just a Roman thing, think again. If you've ever sipped on a delicious zombie or jet pilot cocktail, you may have been enjoying an ingredient called Don's Mix, which was created by Don Beach of Don the Beachcomber in the 1930s and famously kept secret. The formula was lost until a few years ago, modern tiki guru Jeff Beach Bomberry solved the riddle by interviewing people who worked at Don the Beachcombers back in the 30s. Eventually, he found someone with a physical recipe for Don's mix, but the recipe itself turned out to be double encrypted. In addition to two parts grapefruit juice, Don's mix called for one part of something cryptically named Spice Mix Number no. 4, which was blended in secret off site and picked up by bartenders who were not always privy to its components. After tracking down several more past employees of the franchise, Barry was eventually able to determine that Spice Mix Number no. 4 was just cinnamon syrup, equal parts sugar and water infused with cinnamon. And thus, we are once again able to faithfully recreate all the various tiki drinks that called for Don's mix. Of course, recalling back to our Roman example, power and status were again primary motivators for the secret formulation of Don's mix because Don Beach was famously competing with another chain of tiki bars, Trader Vic's, for market share. As one Last little marketing trick, Don would only serve two zombies to any patron on a given day, claiming that they were so strong he needed to limit their consumption. By making his signature cocktail a sort of forbidden fruit and by keeping a tight lid on the true formulation, Don Beach was able to rake in some serious cash and make a name for himself. If there's anything to learn from this parable, it's that there can be both risks and rewards when it comes to keeping a recipe overly simple. The risks, of course, are that some elements will become lost to time or hard to interpret, but there is some serious status to be gained by having a complete monopoly on a certain type of food or drink. 
Apicius set the tone for recipes that lasted straight through the Middle Ages and Renaissance. They were written by and for cooks employed in the houses of the nobility. And because weights and measures varied greatly in many places during these times, you could expect much of the same when it came to details. The recipes are sketchy, and their effective translation relied on specialized training handed down from cook to cook. But following the Renaissance and the Age of Enlightenment, following advances like the printing press and the Columbian Exchange, which sent new ingredients and knowledge across the Atlantic both to and from the New World, the recipe began slowly to evolve. It descended from its mystical, almost alchemical role in those closed-off kitchens of kings and dukes, and found its way into the hands of middle- and working-class people and into the kitchens of a new type of establishment, something called a restaurant. This is the world of a curious man named Jean-Antelme Briat Savarin, a Frenchman who witnessed the fall of monarchs and the tides of revolution, who hunted turkeys, shared meals in the wind and rain, and also dined beside monarchs at Versailles. Part of his life's work was the publication of a curious set of essays called The Physiology of Taste, or Meditations on Transcendental Gastronomy. For our next segment in this Art of the Recipe series, we'll begin by viewing the world through his eyes. We'll look with childlike delight at commodities like sugar, tea, and coffee. We'll watch aghast as a man eats more than 300 oysters before dinner. And we'll work to understand the erotic properties of truffles. From there, we'll wade into the modern world of the recipe and learn exactly what separates a good one from a dud. I hope this little investigation about the origins of the recipe was illuminating and entertaining, and with any luck, it'll give you a better appreciation for just how far we've come since a scribe 4,000 years ago sat down, cracked his knuckles, and started scratching away at a clay tablet. I'm Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick, and this has been a special edition of the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and production assistance by Samantha Reed and a little bit of podcast magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2020.